Today we're going to be presenting uh, the granular convolver. As Aaron said, it's a device that was made uh, especially for the participants of the Rebel Music Academy, which is now taking place in Berlin. Um, it's actually the second time that me and Max collaborated. Um, the first one was last year's um, show in LA. It was called A for 100 Cars. It was a, uh, a composition by um, audiovisual artist uh, Ryoji Ikeda. And we made uh, 100 uh, sine wave generators, um, each with a different frequency. And we played them back through 100 cars with stupidly uh, big sound systems. And we made a big drone piece. Um, conveniently, it has a timer on here so we can keep track of uh, where we are in this lecture. Um, I don't know, do you wanna talk about, I don't actually know how you guys met or what you worked on before, but sure. Start. Yeah, um, I know Max since, I don't know, eight years eight roughly? Eight years, nine years maybe, yeah. Um, we met in university uh, in the undergrads uh, doing electrical engineering and um, we, we started I don't know, studying back then together and then kept on working on several projects. Yeah, we um, did some research together as well, and um, we went uh, together for our, for our um, degrees. We went uh, to Stanford, to Karma, and uh, did research after this together, and we just collaborate on different projects and synthesis and uh, Any in particular? DSP. Oh, there's one in particular. Yeah, there's uh, one in particular, which is, uh, <laughs> which is not, not too public yet, but um, yeah, we're, we're working on a, on a, okay. on a Sorry. On something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> also makes sound. Yeah, yeah. Nice. and um, yeah, and just uh, we just we just I just brought Chris in because uh, we've we've been working together for uh, for some time in the last years. So, yeah, mm. it's the team that made the convolver. Yeah. And also, uh, we have uh, on the left here, uh, Mary Matsutoya, who is a multidisciplinary artist. She works uh, well in the field of technology embodiment, I think, and gender. And uh, she's done performances. Actually, she's done a collaboration with Oral Halo on using uh, uh, the Hatsune Miku Vocaloid. Um, and another thing she does is she uh, takes apart electronic devices on stage um, and then puts them back together again. So this is her granular convolver rendition of that performance and this will be taking place in the background as we give this lecture. Um, so <clears throat> I'd like to explain what this thing actually is. Um, so it's called a, a granular convolver because it um, is a combination of granular synthesis and a process, a mathematical process called convolution. Um, and this came about because, well, firstly, I, I wanted an excuse to build something. Um, so I was thinking, uh, what can we build that would be, you know, especially made for the academy participants? And it should be a, a dub siren. Yeah. It, it proposed the dub siren, actually, yeah. Um, and thank God we didn't make a dub siren. Um, because, um, or any kind of synthesizer, because it would have had a, a certain sound, and we didn't want to make something that would impose a certain sound or a certain uh, tone that everybody had to work with. Um, so the challenge was, how do we make an instrument that doesn't have a voice, that instead you would have to give it that voice? Um, so the obvious thing was to work with samples, um, but obviously, we have a million samplers out there, both in hardware and software. Um, the next idea was, oh, why don't we use samples and do granular synth synthesis with it? Um, but then it would kind of sound like granular synthesis. So um, I was kind of stuck there when I think Max mentioned for a completely different project that we should use convolution. Um, and, and convolution in broad terms is a way of uh, combining two sounds together. Um, so if you have, um, I don't know, if you have, I mean, people usually associate convolution to uh, reverb processing, but actually it's just a way of combining two sounds together and matching the, the spectrum and, and picking out the bits 
that are common to both sounds. So it's a way of marrying two sounds together and coming up with a new sound that sounds like both of the two original sounds, but is actually uh, very different as well. And so I was thinking maybe if we can have sampling and we can have granular synthesis where we can really zoom into the sample and pick out the bits that sound interesting, and then what if we could convolve that with another sound that's coming in in real time? We could be, uh, it, and it could be anything, and it could work for people who aren't synth geeks, it could work with people who are instrumentalists, vocalists, drummers, and, and it would be something that everyone would be able to use. And so this is what it looks like. Um, and you have, uh, you can record 20 slots in here by choosing the slots and best illustrated by actually recording a sample. So I'm gonna record the symbol now. And um, we can play it back. Okay, here it is. Okay. And <clears throat> the granular bit is that you can slice a small fragment of that sample. And we have two controls. We have the grain size, which is the size of that fragment. And we have the position, which is where in that sample you pick this fragment out from. Um, so we can preview the, the grain. And by changing the position within that sample, we can pick out specific parts of that sample. So the attack portion will be that bit. And as we move through the decay, we can hear the higher frequencies dying away. But we're still lis li just listening to the grain right now. And uh, the idea is to convolve something else with it. So in this example, I will connect a contact mic. And start convolving. So. So right now, we're convolving uh, what this pickup is uh, picking up from me hitting it. And this excites uh, the sample. And if I tap on it with my nail, you get more of the highs. If I tap it with, the, with my finger, you don't get so much. And maybe if I... showing more sound demos later um, in conjunction with uh, a bit more of a, a detailed explanation of what convolution actually is. Um, but uh, so this was sent out to all of the Academy participants. If you don't know about the Academy, it's, uh, uh, you can go around and see the studios where it happens. Um, in this building, we have uh, 60 participants coming from 38 different countries. 
And the idea was to send these out to them before they come to Berlin and to collect sounds from home and have a different kind of level of communication and of language to uh, collaborate and work on new sounds together. So these were sent out with these pickups, uh, courtesy of Cork, and uh, these mics, courtesy of Audio Technica. And, um, and so they came in, and we just finished the first term, and they have been doing some pretty crazy stuff with them. Um, it was really important that this was a handheld device. I think it's the first time that this has taken the form of a, of a hardware device. Um, it's battery powered, so you can go around and you can pick up sounds. And, and although there's a USB thing uh, socket here, it's just for power. It's not for loading samples into this unit. So the whole point of this was that you have to be in the physical presence of a sound to capture it. Um, and also, with regards to the controls, maybe, yeah, you can see uh, on the screen there, uh, as Murray takes this apart, these, all these controls have been uh, custom made for this uh, project. Um, all machine, all made in Berlin, actually, amazingly. Um, and each one, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, is uh, laser, laser engraved on the, on the back with uh, the name of each recipient of the participants. So this is, at the same time as being an instrument, it's kind of like a letter to the participants to say, hey, check this out. And also, like, the form that it takes, the, the big knob, you need to kind of, this is my kind of way of thinking about making instruments, is that you actually need, um, it actually needs to unfold um, into an experience where it's kind of uh, saying stuff to you. It needs to speak to you. This, this big thing is big because you, you want the resolution and you want, you want the detail in when you're navigating through the sample. The, the grain size is on a slider because you maybe want to do fast cuts. The longer the grain, the more ambient the sound is. The shorter the grain, it sounds more like a filter. And so these things were all taken into account when uh, designing this thing. Um, and also, we really wanted to strip it down to the bare minimum. Uh, we had ideas about adding uh, a filter to the output or some kind of compression to the output to make it easier to use. But at the same time, we were thinking, what the hell do we know? You know, these participants will come in, they will all use it in their, in their own ways. So we were like, yeah, let's keep it open, let's keep it very simple, two controls, and uh, just be open to what people uh, do with it. So... I mean, just, just, just to add, I mean, also be because um, we weren't sure what, what people come up with in terms of the sound, right? I mean, how people would use this technique, we had no, we had no clue before, like, how to... Yeah, exactly. I mean, some yeah. things that we might think is right would be in the complete, you know, wrong direction of what other people might want to do with it. So, which is why it's just cut a grain and convolve, and that's it. Um, and also, like, the, the actual industrial design reflects that. It's, we've got no surface treatment. These are made from uh, sheet stainless steel. This is before it's just been laser cut, it's before it's been folded into a box. Um, no surface finish, this is the way they buy the material, and it's got this matte uh, gray metal feel to it. Um, all these knobs that are machined, as is, with all the machining marks. Um, and so it's a very kind of, has that kind of pure, um, kind of raw feel to it. So that was very important, in, again, in conveying this kind of message to speaking to uh, the users. Um, maybe with, yeah, okay. Should we talk about what's inside? Maybe, Max, you can talk yeah. about the, yeah. the nuts and bolts, the guts. Yeah, I think um, we are far enough to, um, to see um, some of the, the insides, the guts of the, the convolver. Um, you can imagine the convolver to be a shrink down full computer with a MIDI controller in front of it. Um, The computer itself has just been taken out there. It's this um, um, green little um, little uh, chip there to the, in the middle between the cable and, and the board. Um, and the other board is uh, oh nice, thanks. <laughs> um, 
This is actually this is actually the full computer. It's a computer with four gigahertz. It's a Raspberry Pi that's um, running all the algor audio algorithm on it. That's a board we designed, uh, which contains a sound card and uh, differential mic input. And the board in here is the board which um, takes takes over of all the controls and manages all the the knobs and buttons and LEDs and power management. And um, so I said it's a computer and a MIDI controller. A MIDI controller is actually this. And um, there's a little microprocessor which takes um, care of power management between battery and USB, um, all the LEDs, all the shutdown um, and power, power on sequences, all the buttons, and then sends MIDI to the other board, to the computer, to the Raspberry Pi. And um, the Raspberry Pi is actually running a Linux, a custom Linux that we that we made for this guy that it boots up quickly because you don't want to wait for like I don't know 30, 40 seconds, 50 seconds um, for the convolver to start. Um, yeah, and then the computer is connected to the sound card, and this is where the whole audio stuff happens. So. Audio in goes into the computer, is processed, and then it goes out again. And um, you can imagine this like your DAW, actually like your um, computer. And um, between input and output, we placed a software called Super Collider, open source software, which is um, operating a, a script. You can imagine this like a plugin between input and output that processes all the sound and runs all the algorithm, which is controlled by the interface, which we have here. Um, so, so, so that board's the uh, the board on the bottom there is is basically what you might call like a MIDI controller, right? Right, right. This and one, it, and it actually sends MIDI actually over over the the yeah, cable to the other board. Exactly. Yeah, and then um, this whole I mean, it's all based around um, open source software, basically. Um, if uh, I've been talking to someone. Um, an older engineer recently who said um, that like 20, 30, 40 years, or 30 years ago, it was uh, so hard to get access to these specialized chips and power and um, DSP power and computer power. But all this stuff, um, it's, it's, uh, it's out there now. I mean, we've, we've just been, we were just able to, to do this project in such a, such a fast time because um, we had access to, to, to all these building blocks. It's basically, we just, we just set together a couple of building blocks, which is um, this uh, ARM processor, which does all the low level stuff, all the power stuff, and it's all documented, and there are communities around this, and there's um, there are forums, and there are um, tutorials and application notes, um, and, um, and the same for the Raspberry Pi. Um, this is a, it's a special version of the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi is like a, a tiny computing platform with a powerful processor. Um, this is the, the slimline version, the compute module. Um, it just goes into this little socket up there. Um, and all this stuff is, is just there and all the documentation is, is um, freely available. And um, there was a real benefit in this architecture that we, that we could set on. Yeah, well, uh, one great advantage also to having actually full Linux on there is that it, it, it runs all the software that you know from a normal full-size Linux, obviously, um, which allows for super rapid prototyping, um, which allowed me then to, to try out things quickly, what works, what right, doesn't right. work. Right, right. So Super Collider is, uh, is a cross-platform. Super Collider also would run on your Mac. Super Collider is a scripting language to, um, to script um, what sound like what what how you want to process sound and uh, it runs on uh, it ran on Chris's Mac and it ran on my Linux machine and it, it ran as well on on this tiny little computer so the workflow was um, was pretty well defined from the beginning and um, there was that I was uh, programming and developing the um, the embedded stuff for the um, for the MIDI controller and um, Chris would just do the super collider on his Mac because the Raspberry Pi part wasn't ready yet but he could just start developing, and we were um, we just agreed on a specification to commun communicate between the layers over MIDI, and then he could just use uh, his Mac to write the script and, and just get the DSP get the DSP ready. And when when uh, 
the other stuff was ready. We just joined everything, and it, that was. Really I think great. it's a it's a great time to be building stuff, right? So we don't we have yeah. to worry less about building <clears throat> the small details and making it work, and we can worry more about the creative implications of what we are doing. Um, I think, you know, I think more and more um, access to this kind of technology has opened, has, has first of all made it easier to use. But also, Definitely, it means yeah. that you you just you have more time to worry about how how it's done and what it's doing and the creative side of of using that technology. I think it's it's great that I think it's a really good example of that actually. This yeah, project definitely um, using the means and, and the resources that people have now, and I guess things like uh, Max for Live, if you own Ableton, it's it's in there. You can either build your own instruments or use other people's instruments. And I think, uh, I think it's a really interesting time if you're uh, a musician or, you know, or, or a kind of visual artist or to, be, to have this access to technology because you can do some really cool stuff without having um, the skill or the knowledge of, of all the details and you can work in, in, a, in a kind of, in a, in a macro state. I think it's, it's really great. Yeah, and um, like, you don't even have to design your, your custom hardware. I mean, there's, um, there are, um, boards or kits out there um, where you can just uh, we have audio in and everything. You don't have to do all the the the, uh, the work to to engineer your own your own uh, your own device. Um, that that's all out there. And I think um, there's another nice benefit. I mean, uh, the thing the convolver in this state is completely open and hackable. Uh, um, uh, I would encourage everyone who has one to to screw it open and uh, read the instructions on the back. Um, because yeah, it's just um, you can just connect to it and just even even uh, yeah change your convolver or whatever your convolver does. So uh, into a dub siren. Into a dub siren, yeah. Check out what we're doing on it. Like you have actual <laughs> access to the code if you if you yeah. snoop around a bit. Yeah, yeah. Should we uh, should we talk about what convolution actually is? Go yeah, into a bit more detail. Yeah. What is convolution? Great time. Well. But, <laughs> but before we talk about that, we need to explain what is sound, right? Well, I guess, at least a specific representation. Luckily, we have something prepared. Um, since we're already using our screen. Um, all right. OK, so if you remember, we recorded the hit on the symbol just before, and then we picked out a little grain. and. More or less, you could imagine this grain that we played back, this little hit that uh, you heard before, can be represented in this kind of way, which I s assume most of, or some of you are familiar with, spectrum. Should, should, we, should we listen to the symbol? Yeah, we can. Can, we you, should, can you play yeah. it back? So. Oh, yeah. Let, let's listen to the symbol and. Maybe from the right. So this sound. Um, but if you listen closely, there's like there's the high bits. So yeah. All right. So yeah. essentially, you can break up the sound into the so-called spectrum, right? And you have low frequencies, mid frequencies, high frequencies. Low frequencies would be your bass. Medium, mid frequencies would be voice, guitar, and so on. High frequencies, hi hats, and essentially any sound you can split up into this. And then, the higher you go, the louder that specific area in that sound is. And um, with this uh, symbol recording, for example, we obviously have a lot of energy in the highs because it's a very percussive uh, sound. But we also have some interesting pattern down here, and um, you could just think of this as a representation of how this sound actually sounds to your ears, right? You have quite a bit of highs and a little bit of lows. So now, if you think about what does convolution actually do, we have some more toys on here. White noise. So if you play all the sounds, all the frequencies at the same time, kind of same loudness, something like this is so-called white noise. Right, so this sound has lows, mids, and high frequencies, and all kind of at the same level. And now the cool thing is, if we convolve the two things, we actually get a sound 
that is the overlap of the two, which is now the dark shaded area. Which, as you can tell, is more or less exactly the original sound. Right? So this is the cymbal sound convolved with the white noise, but since convolution is essentially the multiplication of these two things, which now is represented as the shaded, the dark area, this is almost the original sound. All right, so maybe we can hear it again real quick, the convolution. Can, can we hear the noise? The, the noise without the convolution. Okay, so now you can play back your old sound. We already did this, it's kind of boring. Um, let's maybe go to the most basic sound you can imagine, and that is a single frequency, it's essentially an oscillator. So this sounds like this. There's a bit more here. All right, so this is just a single sinusoid playing. This can be a low bass note, right? This can be a mid, which could be here go very high. And the same thing is true as before, that convolution is the multiplication of the two spectra. And now you can see something cool. As we move this around, different parts of the two spectra overlap, and different parts are now shaded in dark. All right? So if we can hear the result of the convolution. This is more or less what we described before, some sort of mix of some sort of mix of the both uh, of both signals. But obviously we can go a bit further because also this is kind of a boring input signal. So now if you use a more interesting complex spectrum, which in this case represents just a more complex synth node, right? So maybe it sounds like this. It's very defined fundamental again, but with like some overtones, something that would come out of a synthesizer. Now something really cool happens. Now we have some really complex overlap of the two spectra. And we can obviously move it around. Obviously, again, now depending on where you are, obviously, depending on both signals, the overlap changes, which produces really interesting new uh, sonic properties. Right, and obviously, you don't need to use a uh, synthesized sound at all. You can use, for example, voice, very straightforward. Um, can you help with this? Thank you for <laughs> being a stand for a couple of minutes. I think you can, since you have the controls, maybe you talk a bit about what's going on. Because I'm speaking through the right symbol. Or? <laughs> you should have some more sense, no? All right. 
And then obviously you can just go off, go ahead and jam with it. Afterwards? Yeah. Okay. Or okay. You, but we, we haven't finished rebuilding the thing. Mari yeah, hasn't I mean, we can, we can jam out a bit. Convolver is uh, is a beast. Um, fifteen. Fifteen. Where are? But um, if we stay in the symbol, I mean, we can also check out what what else Tad's recorded secretly into his Convolver. Um, she hasn't told us yet. Might be embarrassing. I have no idea what samples I have in there. Um, but I mean, you're not you're not limited to um, you're not limited at all to uh, to um, impulsy stuff like the symbol that we've just recorded. So there's basically, um, for, for convolution, um, you could, I personally find it works best um, when, you, when you think of it like having one thing which is more impulsy and one thing which is more textural. Um, this reminds you maybe a bit, if you're familiar with a convolutional reverb where you record room impulse ins uh, responses and um, which catch the whole frequency information or resonant information of a room. Um, but, um, so here w w with the symbol, w which is more, more of an impulse, um, we, uh, we've transferred um, a more textual or still, still um, impulsive sound with, um, with uh, the texture of the symbol. But uh, what I wanted to say is, um, it works best if you if you just use one of each. If you have one textural thing and one impulsive thing, and um, that but, but that's what you think. Yeah, that's what I think, of course. Yeah. But I've seen like I've seen people in term one convolving flute with with spoken voice, or mm. synths with other synths, which aren't like combinations of uh, rhythmical things with textural things. I think you can do yeah. textural. Yeah, textual. true. I mean, you can also go long. It just becomes a big drone. hissy stuff uh, of the symbol cutting through there. That's a that's a flexi tone if anyone knows what that is. Thank you. 
Max, can we hear the, the, the dry sound and also the sample? I, I can't recognize what this sample is. Okay. That's a dry sound? Dry sound, yeah. And... I still don't recognize what this is. Oh, I remember now. This was this was uh, this was the sample I used for a gig actually, and they were uh, they had loads of uh, drinks on a trolley, and they were dragging it across the floor, which I thought was a wonderful sound. Um, yeah, I mean, you you played a gig already with it. Um, yeah. In Moscow, I think, right? Yeah. So how was so your experience? It was, it was really good because I I was just looking uh, going around looking for interesting sounds, um, and I guess the point of this instrument is that. Um, yes, it's it's a fun and it's an interesting way of working with sound. It's a new way of working with sound, but ultimately, it's it's about it's about listening more and it's about paying attention to sounds more. And I think that's a real driver for for this kind of um, kind of driving creativity and inspiring people to make uh, different music. Um, and I think uh, so far it's been pretty positive, turn one's been going very well, everyone's been very engaged, and I've seen at least three acts uh, who have incorporated the Convolver into their live sets, and uh, we'll see what happens in term two. Maybe there's footage of that that's due to come out. Um, I think that wraps up our talk. Yeah. Okay, and yeah. there we go. I think we should... Bravo, Mari. <laughs> Yeah, I think we should open for questions and uh, just just open the conversation with you guys. There should be a mic somewhere. Any questions? No, no, it's very easy. Cool. We live. Oh. <clears throat> it is a super cool idea to fuse two different sounds, and you made it sound as if this was uh, the first, like, it's, it's a new thing. Um, when you said that you can combine two different synthesizers, for example, I imagined that to turn out really funky stuff. And so my question is, has this n not been done before, or has it just not been done before to put such technology into such a small device? Uh, I think the latter. I mean, uh, it, it's been done. Like convolution itself, the math is what it's like hundreds of years old or something. Yeah, it's, like it's super years old. old or something. Yeah. Uh, but but it's a very uh, an expensive, as in like computationally expensive process. So um, it's only recently that that it's been, or in the last few decades, that it's been possible to actually uh, use in in processing sounds, and even more recent. Um, that we can um, actually put this in, in a handheld hardware device. So I think, to my knowledge, this is the first time um, that this kind of convolution or granular convolution has been uh, put into um, a dedicated piece of hardware. It's, I mean, um, I, I think the only place where, you, as a kind of in the, in the creative music production kind of context, you would at least as a user coming into contact with convolution is, is reverbs, reverb plugins. Um, Guitar simulation, probably amp but, simulation. Right, but I don't think you actually know that it's convolution inside. Sure, yeah. Like the only time you read convolution is maybe in, in, in reverb context and it's been used in other plugins already since now you usually have plenty of power in all the machines. Um, but I don't think it's been outside of maybe more sound design, uh, been very much in kind of a focus of, of of, of the creative process. Tart, may I call you Tart? Of course. <laughs> cool. Um, you said that you use it in one of your gigs. Yes. Um, what kind of sounds did you use? Because um, you spoke about um, the difference between more impulsy and more textured stuff. And uh, I'd like to hear how you used it in your set. Uh, I played an ambient set. Um, 
So, but it, but it was a combination of uh, some percussive sounds and some synthesizers. It was a very simple setup. I had um, two synthesizers. Uh, actually, I, I had the Volker FM going into the monotribe, which is an analog synth, and it has analog drums on it. And the monotribe was filtering the FM output. So I essentially had like one output that was going into the convolver, and which was a mix of kind of Picasso like hats and with kind of paddy chord stuff that was being chopped up with the monotribe filter, um, which is one of my favorite combinations, by the way. But um, and then so that was being uh, smeared out using this this device and being convulsed with that trolley sound that we just heard and it just made some really beautiful textures and I was just like just changing the grain size uh, just slowly going through the sample picking out various small kind of nuances um, in in the in the grain and just moving through that for a whole hour and it was it, I thought it was great I'm curious to hear. I hope others do too. Thanks. Thank you. I think gentlemen on right. Um, it's a two-part question. So <coughs> you said basically convolution is multiplying, right? You multiply just two waves. Of in the, the spectrum. In the spectra, in the, in the frequency domain of the sound. I mean, uh, okay. what we've just shown on this, on this green yeah. white sheet that, that shows yeah, yeah, all yeah. It, right? Um, so my question is, is it, um, if you have like a Eurorack module that is a multiplier, is that essentially con well, then, convolution? No, then you can, you can uh, multiply the time domain. I mean, the wave itself, like mm -hmm. if you just imagine this being a sine wave. Oh, I see. would represent as just a line in the spectrum because the spectrogram just shows you all frequencies and their magnitude. And if you have a sine wave in the time domain, it will look like this and just go on forever. But in the spectrum, it will be just one line. Mm -hmm. and what you want to do is multiply the frequencies that are in both sounds, not the time domain signal, which is the waveform, and see. then transfer it into pressure. Because then it would just pressure. be a ring modulator, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. exactly. Yeah. And so... It, the um, third part, I guess. Um, so if you have um, something that does this multiplication and you connect um, um, a granular synthesizer into that, then essentially you've got the convolver, right? Or no, you're still I multiplying time domain signals. Okay. Um. No, but I'm saying if you have because something there, that does the multiplication of the uh, Not the spectrum. multiplication, but the con convolution, you mean. The if convolution, you had a con yeah, yeah. Live ah, convolution yeah. device, and, yeah. and you had some kind of granular thing before it. I mean, you just even need a granular yeah. sampler, maybe. I mean, mm. what, what the granular convolver does, it just takes a, what we call the grain from a bigger recording, and it analyzes the frequency content of this grain, and then uses this as the fingerprint to imply on the, on the live input. And um, if, you, if you change the controls, you slice out a different grain. Mm. And we just do per ca calculations in parallel to analyze this one and then crossfade between these different grains. So if you had a, something which does convolution, you just, it will always need something to analyze. Mm. And this would be the same, actually. And do you have do you have like um, any plans of doing this in Eurorack format or? Um, no. um, we don't even have plans to sell this thing. Oh, okay, it's just uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so so we don't know. Um, like I said, it, it's it's very it's it's a very kind of raw and and, and a very minimal uh, implementation of granular convolution, um, and I think we're still learning, and we're still trying to figure out. Firstly, whether it would make uh, a good commercial uh, product um, and, and what the possibilities are. I think those are very open things that we're just kind of trying to absorb right now. Okay. I mean, you can see it all already on the form factor and after, um, after the rounds of questions and discussion, you can also hold it if you want. It's, it's um, I think, yeah, the nice thing about the, um, 
the, the collaborations with Tats and the Academy um, is, I think, also, besides it's a lot of fun, um, that, we, um, that we can also make um, material studies or uh, call it like, yeah, product design studies. I mean, this is, this is super far from, from being a commercial product in every sense of manufacturing and, um, and like, mean, like it's, it doesn't make sense to make it like this, but it's nice like this. You know, and it's uh, it feels good. And I've seen um, people using uh, stuff that looks a lot worse. So. Yeah, and um, yeah. the same thing with the um, with this with this guy. We we actually we explored aluminium in this one, and we explored stainless steel in that one. Um, so, to answer your question from 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 another perspective, we we would also have to completely re-engineer it, in in every sense, if there would be an idea of making it available. Thanks. Be nice. <laughs> Say again? Be nice. Uh, well, thanks for the great talk. That was a, the visual aids were amazing, and I may borrow them for, for teaching in the future. Um, my question is actually quite simple. Uh, it's about the choice of technology for the, the unit. You're using a Raspberry Pi. Um, I mean, just maybe to support uh, the first question, like I guess convolution from experience is, is a very simple concept, but it's the reason it's hard to implement, right? It's very CPU hungry, and this is why this is a, such a unique product, in my opinion. Well, it's not really a product, but a unique unique uh, device. Uh, how much? My question is, how much are you pushing the limits of this Raspberry Pi? You mentioned hacking. How much space did you leave for, you know, anyone who's lucky enough to have one? How much can they do still on top of what's already running? Well, we're only we're only using two of the four cores actually, aren't we? Um, but but that was more more a trade of of, um, of battery life because it had to be a portable device. So right. so we we it was kind of yeah finding the balance of what would make sense. If you wanted to really push the capabilities of the Raspberry Pi, then yes, you would get more. But that wasn't really the point. I mean, you would probably get a, a longer uh, grain size, you would work, work, be able to work with longer uh, grains, but because um, currently the setting is from 7 milliseconds to 700, um, but that is enough if you want to zoom into a certain fragment of the sound and, and kind of use that, then you actually don't need long convolution. So sure. it kind of depends on what you want to do, but in terms of performance, yeah, we can push it a bit more. Maybe. A and bit more detail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in in general, like CPU load wise, on average, we're like below fifty. Yeah, I think in the twenties, maybe thirty. Well, I mean, whatever the, the, the precise number is, it's more that you have to. Since there are certain times we have to do a lot. In this case, um, just time wise, uh, you have there's performance spikes where you obviously you can't hit 100%, otherwise you have dropouts and will sound absolutely terrible. Um, like in a, in a screen, you can have a dropout when you miss a, if you miss a frame, it's not that bad, but in sound, if you have just a tiny slice of silence, it will sound terrible. So it absolutely cannot drop a single frame, obviously. Um, and that might be just the, the problem that you had before actually having the average CPU load very high. I was just asking in terms of uh, just curiosity of how how much hacking space. Yeah, but there's there's definitely there is definitely space. I mean, there's that's great. And if if not, just sh sh remove the convolver script and just put something else there. <laughs> then you have the full CPU power. All right. Thanks, guys. Are we good? Okay, let's wrap it up. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you.